As I'm recording this, it is only the second time since 1962 we've gone six years without a new 007 movie. No Time to Die would have been out by now if not for COVID-19, but with its delay, the gap is widening. Few franchises have the sort of lifespan James Bond does, so how has it held audiences for so long? Over nearly seven decades, 25 official Bond films have been released, starring six different actors. With the release of the first Bond film, Dr. No, in 1962, the Vatican weighed in, saying the movie was <clears throat> a dangerous mixture of violence, vulgarity, sadism, and sex. Now though, James Bond is a household name, and one that generations have grown up with. Although there was certainly some stuff pushing the PG-13 rating in a few of these. This video is going to take a look at the iconic character and franchise of James Bond. I'll not be focusing on a particular film or going through each one individually. Instead, I want to look more at the property as a whole. I want to talk about the gadgets, the lost Hitchcock Bond movie, the effects on fashion and cars and how people order their martinis, and how the world shaped Bond as the franchise evolved. James Bond has a long history and an invested fandom. I grew up with these movies as a big part of my life. My dad had the box set of DVDs, and although I'd not claim to be an expert on Bond, I have in fact seen every movie at least twice. My dad is a huge Bond fan and took my brother and I to the theaters for the release of each new movie that came out in my lifetime. This wasn't just a thing for my family though. My friends were into it too, and everybody at least knew who James Bond was. By the time I was born, James Bond had been one of the most recognizable characters in the world for decades already. Bond is more than just a character though. He's a cultural icon outside of storytelling at this point. The effect 007 has had on fashion, cars, and cocktail orders is quite a marvel, honestly. A character so iconic that his every association is celebrated doesn't come around too often. Bond's iconic car, the Aston Martin, is so associated with him that the company counts on releases of new movies to help their sales, as they aren't doing so well anymore. And they're not the only ones. Bond drove an AMC Hornet in a single movie, and AMC used that to sell Hornets for years after. Bond's famous request to have his martini shaken, not stirred, convinced many that this was the way to go, despite martinis being stirred for a reason. There's really no reason I can find, actually, to shake your martini, unless you want to make it cloudy. But hey, if James Bond does something, damn me if that doesn't make it seem cool. Shaken, but not disturbed. <laughs> Bond has been on the big screen since the 60s, and all the while, people have looked to him on how to dress. Although, as with the passing of time, certain trends seem less relatable, like Timothy Dalton's tan, shoulder-padded suit in The Living Daylights. Hmm. Bond has always been dressed exceptionally well, at least in the eyes of the time. Perhaps with the faults of 80s fashion aside, James Bond is the default for a well-dressed man. I know for a fact that's why my dad wears all those polo shirts. Through all the decades of Bond films we've gotten, not all have done as well as others. But I suppose you can't always get it right. The franchise has some notable shortcomings in movies like A View to a Kill, starring a 57-year-old Roger Moore, taking the role in a slightly creepier direction, which is apparently why Moore ended up leaving the franchise. Despite a few movies falling a bit flat on delivery, none would be considered a failure financially. When accounting for inflation, 1989's License to Kill is the only movie not to make over a hundred million dollars at the box office. And it wasn't that far off either. My favorite aspect of 007, particularly as a kid, was always the spy gadgets. Bond's gadgets are always a highlight. The setup for them, delivered in the debriefings with Q, is such a fun way to introduce all the gear in Bond's arsenal. And the setup's super important. Introducing your perfect solution to a seemingly inescapable problem keeps the audience from feeling too cheated. Although some of the gadgets over the years are a bit overly specific. I mean, that sure was the most convenient height they could have set that wire at. But as important as these scenes are for avoiding a deus ex machina sometimes, 
The bickering banter of Bond and Q is hilarious. Eject a seat, you're joking. I never joke about my work, 007. Desmond Llewellyn played the role of Q from 1963 to 1999, appearing in 17 movies along five different Bonds. The original books were not as full of gadgets, and neither were the first couple of movies, but with the introduction of Q and Goldfinger, the concept was well received and appeared in nearly every movie since. The role of Quartermaster, where we get the name Q, or at least the loadout scene, is part of the anatomy for action, and specifically spy movies these days. Among gadgets Bond has used himself and others we've seen in the background, there have been some pretty outlandish ones, including among other things a clawed umbrella, a safe cracker which of course doubles as a photocopier, as well as of course the coolest gadget of all time, the fake nipple. Something crazy I found out was the jetpack in Thunderball was real. It looks kind of silly, honestly, but they got a prototype hydrogen peroxide rocket belt and had a stunt pilot fly it around. The reason Bond wears that goofy helmet is because the pilot wouldn't do the stunt without one. And they actually ended up having to go back and reshoot some of Connery's scenes to have him put on and remove the helmet. These gadgets do sometimes require a bit of movie magic to really sell, but a surprising amount of stunts in these movies are done for real. I couldn't believe that skydiving scene when I watched Moonraker the other night. Not only did they have to stage a fight while falling, they also had to film it. Producer Mike Wilson apparently found a one-of-a-kind 35mm lightweight lens in a second-hand camera store in France. Without that lens, the footage would have been a different quality than the rest of the film, or the camera would have simply been too heavy to jump with. 007 has pulled off some insane stunts in his films, and a lot of the time, that means somebody pulled off something at least similar in real life. Not to completely discount the stories and everything else, but these are action movies, and action, boy they've got it. Although the Sean Connery era Bond wasn't as much of a thrill-seeking spy as his later incarnations, his movies still got a few wild stunts and were host to a fair deal of onset explosives. In later movies though, especially the Roger Moore era, the character of James Bond had much more of a penchant for ridiculous feats that called for some truly incredible stunt work. The famous corkscrew flip is absolutely mind-blowing. Joey Chitwood was the stunt driver for this flip, and he nailed it in one take. This was partly thanks to this being the first computer simulation-tested stunt. I know a lot of people do, but I don't personally have an issue with CGI or digital effects. If they're good, they're good and you probably can't tell they're there. But if you actually do the stunt, it's hard for it to look faked. One thing that really sold me and got me invested in the newest Bond era was its first scene. The opening parkour chase of Casino Royale is so engaging and exciting and largely done for real. The man Bond is chasing in this scene is played by Sébastien Foucault, one of the early developers of parkour and the founder of freerunning. You can tell by the way Foucault moves in this sequence that he knows what he's doing, and he's doing it for real. One unfortunate truth though, is that technology ages quickly these days, and filmmakers can get excited by the possibilities that certain effects can offer, even if the effects aren't that great themselves. In the upcoming No Time to Die, many of the shots of the Aston Martin are going to be CGI, as apparently the danger, and therefore insurance involved with these stunts and chases just became too high. We're at a point in time where it's both cheaper to digitally render a fake car than risk crashing one, and also we're at a point where you can probably make the car look believable. VFX has thankfully come a long way since the 90s. The thing is, no matter what effects you use, movies age. And one thing I think that can help a movie age well is a sense of humor towards itself. A bit of campiness in a movie turns what could become outdated into novelty. Even the film debut, Dr. No, was said to be full of submerged self-parody by the observer's Penelope Gilead. I think finding a balance of action and thrill with cheeky humor and self-awareness as to how ridiculous some of these things are is the key to a good Bond movie. Just make sure not to overdo it with the post-murder puns. Oh. Oh. Well, he certainly left with his tails between his legs.
Ugh. The tone of Bond movies has changed and developed a lot over the years. Each actor and respective era for James Bond have their own vibe. The character has always been cheeky and debonair, but the grittiness seems to shift around a lot. I think there's merit to most takes on the character, and credit due to each actor who played him. There are six official James Bond actors, and I say official because there are two James Bond films not produced by Eon Productions. Eon was started by Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman in 61, and has produced 25 James Bond films. Aside from the Eon films, there was a 1967 version of Casino Royale, loosely based on the novel. And I mean quite loosely. The 67 Casino Royale is really quite a mess. It's supposed to be a spy parody sort of thing. I'm as good thighs. I can see that. But it's absolutely jumbled and all over the place. The main reason this movie is so chaotic? Well, there were six directors. It does sadden me though that we never got to see Orson Welles as a real Bond villain. The other unofficial Bond movie is still odd in how it came to be, but definitely more watchable. 1983 saw Sean Connery reprise his role as James Bond 12 years after his last appearance in the non-Eon productions Never Say Never Again, the title of which is apparently a reference to Connery leaving the role in 1971. The movie was sort of another version of Thunderball which had already been adapted into a Sean Connery Bond film 18 years before. The movie came out of a long legal battle around the rights to adapt the story. Something else I really wish we had gotten to see is an Alfred Hitchcock entry in the Bond canon. Ian Fleming's first choice to direct the debut Bond movie was in fact Hitchcock, and even wrote an original screenplay not based on a previous novel, for Hitchcock to direct. After the movie was shelved for reasons we're not entirely sure of, the screenplay would actually be turned into the novel Thunderball. Some sources claim Hitchcock said he was too busy with Psycho, but as this was so long ago, all the information I found seemed speculative at best. With the shelving of the screenplay though began the legal troubles that resulted in Never Say Never Again. But that story is a bit too long for this video. The sentiment of never again seems not to be unique to Sean Connery. Being 007 takes a lot of commitment, flying around the world for filming, learning choreography for fights, not to mention if you're doing many of your own stunts like Timothy Dalton. No Time to Die will be Daniel Craig's fifth James Bond movie, and though he's walked back the comment, after rapping on Spectre back in 2015 he said, I'd rather slash my wrists than play Bond again. I gave a fairly blunt answer. Graphic hands. Yeah, yes. I mean. 27 films and dozens of novels, not to mention every video game, comic strip, and so on, are no small feat. I think the real next level of canon is having a Wikipedia page of your parodies, though. They say imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. James Bond, in fact, has had two decently successful parody trilogies in Austin Powers and Johnny English. You've got to be iconic to have two separate franchises reference and mock you for five hours each. Ian Fleming released Casino Royale, the first 007 novel, in 1953. Fleming was a British author, journalist, and former naval intelligence officer. In Fleming's lifetime, he wrote 12 Bond novels, all of which have movie versions now and two collections of Bond short stories. Fleming also wrote three other books in his lifetime, including Chitty Chitty Bang Bang of all things. Fleming's legacy didn't end there. Though he would only live to see two of his Bond novels adapted to movies, his creations are still being added upon today, and not only with the film franchise. James Bond has appeared in countless books from other authors since Fleming's death in 1964. The most recent at time of recording was released in 2018. Nearly seven decades after Fleming's first novel, the character has changed drastically. Even in Fleming's life, he would change the character, adding Scottish vernacular to Bond after Connery's portrayal became so important to the character. As beloved as Bond is though, he carries a lot of baggage from the past. I'm gonna warn you, it's gonna get a bit dark right here, and I'm gonna talk about some uncomfortable subject matter. I think it would be irresponsible to make this video without this section in it, so here it is. The character of James Bond, especially in the novels and earliest films, is not a wholesome character. His interactions with women are often dubious and occasionally straight up constitute assault. 
In 1964's Goldfinger, there is a truly disturbing scene in a barn where Bond forces himself on the character named Pussy Galore. And if there's any question to the consent in this scene, don't worry, the book makes it very clear that no, there is not. This movie came out 56 years ago, which doesn't mean it's not awful, but at least the character has had time to evolve into not that at the very least. Frankly, Ian Fleming's vision of James Bond is a pig, and also seems designed to serve up imperialist nostalgia. There's a lot wrong with the early films aside from this, and there are loads of essays and scholarly works looking at it. I think a positive thing though is that while this will always be the origin of James Bond, it doesn't look like it is his present or his future. The Bond we have today has come a long way since his inception. I think it's pretty obvious that what we have now suits the times a lot better. I still enjoy the whole franchise, but it's good to be conscious of some of the dated ideas presented in the earlier movies. That said, watching the Bond movies from the 60s up to today is such a unique and special experience. Not only are the movies just generally well made and fun to watch for the most part, but as a history of filmmaking shown through one beloved character, it presents such an interesting and entertaining lens to view the past 60 years. No Time to Die is set to be Daniel Craig's last film as James Bond, and although there are rumors of who is next to carry the torch, there's not enough that I know as to tell you who it'll be. With the legacy of 007 soon to be built upon once more, I'd like to end with a couple thoughts. As Martin Parker put in his 2018 essay, Employing James Bond, given the multiplicity of cultural texts here, it simply isn't possible to say what Bond represents or means without being specific about which Bond is being referred to. Something amazing about one character being repurposed and reimagined over decades is watching its evolution alongside society. Finally, this Bond or the next might not be your favorite, but I think as long as they keep making them, they will always be relics of their time. Hey, it's Tobias here. Thanks so much for watching, and let me know down in the comments which Bond movie is your favorite, or at least which era, maybe. I know it's a kind of tough question. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like, and if you'd like to see more great stuff like this, subscribe to Screen Rant. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.